Americans anymore, it's native people or indigenous people. The Wampanoags lived here for thousands of years before the English even knew this place was here. And uh, most scientists, excuse me, believe that at least 10 to 15,000 years they lived here before. Peacefully with the land, so to speak, and got along pretty well until the Europeans came here. But the, but the Wampanoags uh, do make peace with the, nat with the uh, colonists here pretty quickly. The tribe here in Patuxet, as this place is called, you can see by the yellow map, that place is called Patuxet, where Plymouth is today. And Patuxet was the homeland of uh, part of the Wampanoag tribe, but the whole yellow area is actually Wampanoag territory. Uh, where you see the word of Kushnet, and that, that area is where the um, sachem of the tribe lived, Massasoit. He lives in that section of the area, so when the plague hits Patuxet and wipes out all the people here, those that are left move down towards the stage and live there. So there's nobody living here. It's an empty place. One of the reasons the colonists choose to live here is to, uh, because it is an empty place ready-made for plantation. All the fields are cleared for planting. There's lots of fresh water and springs. And it's a perfect place to build a plantation. There was a native uh, burial site here, correct? Well, they, they, when, <laughs> when they, when they land here, they find unburied bodies mm -hmm. laying around because the plague just killed them off. There was nobody left to bury them. Mm -hmm. They basically found bones, and, and, and they could tell that something terrible happened here. Mm -hmm. Although, other than that, there's nobody here, and they could tell by the look of the fields that they haven't been planted or used for about five years. And they find out later, of course, that a European plague brought by fishermen and explorers many years before had killed this tribe off, and they thought the land cursed here. I think they were Frenchmen, possibly, who were fishing off the coast, or could have been, could have been anybody. anybody. French, yeah. Spanish, Portuguese. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could have been John Smith's men. John Smith mapped this whole area in 1614, and that's just about the right timing. One of John Smith's lieutenants gathers native people here and sells them to slavery into Spain. Mm. He was left behind to collect lumber and herbal medicines, but he makes the choice that people are much more profitable. Yes. So that's kind of the story on the native people. You'll learn more about them at Hubbamock's village tomorrow. Hubbamock was the native warrior who was sent to live close to the colonists to keep his eye on them and to be uh, Massasoit's interpreter. As it's not a village, actually. It's Hobblemock's home site. Hmm. It was a home for Hobblemock and his family. Probably about 12 people. Colonist on board Mayflower. Mayflower, of course, is hired by the merchant adventurers, the investors who are paying for this whole trip. And they hire a ship to carry their people, and they hire their people. And then they find out there's a group of people that have escaped England for religious persecution and been living in Holland for 12 years. They also want to be part of the deal. They want to sign the contract and be workers too. And they're going to put in some extra money by supplying a ship that will bring them from Holland or Delfshaven, which is the port that they sail from, to Southampton and meet up with Mayflower here sometime late in June. Well, Speedwell doesn't show up till late in July, the first time they leave. Hampton is August. So all of these people are on Mayflower. Uh, well, actually about 70 people on Mayflower and about 45 on Speedwell. These are all the people that end up on Mayflower. These are the people we know where they came from. These are the people who we know were on the ship and don't know where they came from. And these are the people that were born in Holland to those people who escaped. So the only home they've known so far is Holland. They are English children. So there's 102 of them, there's 50 men, 20 adult women, and 32 children. When Mayflower's waiting in Southampton with 70 people, she's there for probably the better part of two months until Speedwell finally shows up, and they leave together. And out to sea quite a bit, Speedwell fails. She leaks so badly they have to bring her into the port of Dartmouth, which they spend time working on the ship there. And then finally when that's repaired, somewhere around the 15th of August, they leave here, and 300 miles out to sea, they find that Speedwell is not working at all. She's leaking so badly that they return to the River Ply or Plymouth, and they make the decision to leave the ship behind there, mm -hmm. transfer people, and Mayflower leaves on the 6th of September by herself with 102 people aboard and sails directly straight across the Atlantic to Cape Cod. First piece of land they see is Cape Cod on the 9th of November. They turn and head toward the original destination, 
the investors who are paying for all this trip have got a grant from King James to settle at the mouth of Hudson's River, or what we call Manhattan today. And that's where they're heading for, but the first piece of land they see, which is pretty normal, is Cape Cod. They turn and head towards New York, but decide it's too dangerous to get there, or probably too sick and tired of traveling, that's my opinion. And they decide <laughs> to come back and anchor at Cape Cod. They anchor at the tip of Cape Cod, they call Cape Harbor, or on John Smith's map, Milford Haven. They anchor there for five weeks before they find from it. Find Plymouth until the 12th of December in a small boat called the Shallop that you'll see today, and they don't come here to Plymouth until sometime after Christmas. Why did they want to? Why did they stay anchored for five weeks in that ship after being on that long, because perilous they don't know voyage? They're nervous of the Native Americans. They don't know if there's they can trust them or not. Shore. Right. There's nothing on shore for them. I mean, people get off and explore, but they're pretty all sick and dying from seasickness. So only well enough to mm. go ashore would go ashore. The women supposedly went ashore on Monday to do wash, the first Monday. That's why Monday used to be here in America, wash day, but that's, you know, I oh, okay. don't know if that's really true or not, but that's what they said. <laughs> so basically when they hit Cape Cod, they've lost one passenger during the journey. William Button dies from a servant to the, uh, I think he's here somewhere on this list, William Button, maybe not. William oh, Button right there. Yeah, and he's a servant the Fuller family. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, I believe he's a servant of the Fuller family. He's about 18 years old. He dies a day or two before he sees New England. Then there's another sailor that dies uh, halfway across. But all the people make it to Cape Cod except for that. But they're sick and dying from seasickness. And of course, they've reached a climate that's not going to be very friendly to them. And as the winter passes, by April 5th, when the ship returns to England, half the crew has already died. Jones goes home to England, leaving the colony behind with only 52 people. 52 people, 10 of whom are single men and women, and 42 who are older men and children. The women and the single men don't do very well at all. Oh, not a great way to start a colony. 20 adult, well, it's the first, uh, first man, woman, and child colony in the world. All the other colonies have been founded strictly by men. Right, Jamestown was strictly men. All men. Yeah. St. Augustine, Florida, mm -hmm. all men. French up north in the same time as Jamestown, just about all men. So this is the first time it, it's, Roanoke was men, women, and children, but it fails. Well, the lost they colony. They don't yeah. ever what happened to that. Mm -hmm. So Plymouth becomes the first um, men, women, and children colony and the first colony in New England. So in Northern Virginia, the first colony in Northern Virginia, as they would call it. They have a map of John Smith's of New England, but they're still referring to this as Northern Virginia. Everything north of the Hudson River to Canada is Northern, Northern Virginia. Virginia. Everything from Hudson River south to Florida is Southern Virginia. Hmm. Yeah. So, Mayflower 2. Mayflower 2 looks a lot like that picture, except it's not bright colors anymore. It's more dull down. We found out in research that military ships were colored that way, and that's certainly not what Mayflower was. She was a merchant ship built for the lumber and wine trade, and had never even carried people before, only this one time. It's the only time she was ever hired to carry people as a cargo. But it's the dream child, Mayflower 2, of a man named Warwick Chalton. Warwick Chalton had a dream in World War II if he ever finished the war in one piece, working for General Montgomery, he would build a full-size reproduction of Mayflower and sail it to the United States as a gift to the Yanks, as he called it. So it was a great bond between England and the United States. He thought that would be a fine thing to do. He <laughs> founds a group called Project Mayflower. Project Mayflower Limited is going to raise the money, build the ship, and sail it here to the United States. In the meantime, he finds out that this man with the strange name, Henry Hornblower, who founded Plymouth Plantation, had already had a full-size set of plans drawn up by this famous MIT naval architect named William Baker. But as far as the plantation has gotten was this. So he comes over here, makes a deal with Henry Hornblower. I'll raise the money, I'll build the ship, bring it here, you provide the plans and a place to dock her permanently, and we'll make a deal. So he hires Alan Villiers to bring the ship here, and it's the deal is made. Basically. The ship was uh, started in 1955. This keel was laid. The keel is 58 feet long. It was laid in 19, September of 1955. The ship was finished up into a hull by with using all English oak, of course, and the same materials and tools that the pilgrims would have used. Not the pilgrims, but the people that built ships in those days. It was launched as a hull in 1955.
1985, put in dry dock, the rest of the ship finished up on top of that, and then launched again in 1956. How often is it in dry dock? Every I know other it's year. It has to be in dry dock every other year. Every other year. By the Coast Guard. And what usually happens is we move about eight tons of ballast. They check out all the beams underneath the ballast. Uh, we put it back together. They refinish the bottom, repaint it, clean it, repaint it, and then it's put back in the water and we come home. But this year it didn't happen that way. We found a lot of problems up in the upper uh, beams up in here. So all the problems are up in the upper beams more towards the stern of the ship. Hmm. So you know, they're doing the same thing to Constitution right now, the USS Constitution. Oh, they've rebuilt her a number of times. Yeah. She's pretty much back in one piece now. They're always working on that. We had one of our, uh, one of our maritime artisans work for the Constitution for two years, and they did a major restoration a couple of years ago. He was like the contract worker for two years. Here. When the ship was anchored out, the Mayflower, would they use a vessel like this, I guess, to go to shore? Yeah, the shallop is the boat that the pilgrims carry. You can see it better from out there. Okay. We'll there in a minute. Pictures are on the sail. The uh, day she was uh, sailed from England, uh, Warwick Charlton, uh, Henry Hornblower, and the captain bridges here. And then the 20th of April, she left on the sail in the Atlantic somewhere <laughs> with wind behind her, of course, going along at a fairly good rate, passed by an American destroyer just for a look-see, but she traveled all by herself on a score that she has no auxiliary power. The only power aboard is a small generator, or was a small generator to run the uh, bilge pumps that the Coast Guard required and the two-way radio to contact the outside world. We have a bigger generator now, so we can have electric lights. They didn't have that. They only had oil lamps on board. Felix the Cat was the mascot of Mayflower 2. He used to climb up on the rigging way up here and um, afraid if he fell off the ship, he's so small they lose sight of him, couldn't turn fast enough to pick him up. So Jan Junker, the third mate, made a life, life jacket, jacket for him, yeah. and he wore the life jacket for the rest of the trip. The crew dressed primarily like this. On Sundays they dressed in pilgrim clothing and had a church service on the hmm. command deck of the ship. That's a picture of the 57 crew in their 17th century clothing. There are 33 men all together. Captain Villiers brought these four men with him and then all the rest of these men were picked out from 3,000 letters sent in at the time. Picture of the crew in 57, uh, 77 when they came here. Uh, and then picture of the crew in 2000. You can see the older men sitting here. Uh, there's 11 of them in there somewhere. And the new crew have the purple shirts on. That's me peeking through without a beard. And uh, we took them on a nice sail for 2000. And there's only seven left alive today. And the youngest is J Joseph Meany or Joe Meany, the American cabin boy. Hmm. These two boys won scholarships from the Boys Club of the World, four years of school, and a trip on Mayflower too. And Joe Meany graduated from MIT and became a big shot engineer at, at Digital. Joe, uh, Graham Nunn died young, fairly young, I think at 40. But do a lot of these, uh, the descendants of a lot of these people make uh, contributions to maintain the no. ship, or is it is it the state that funds it? Or? No, it's all private donations. All private like donations. Here, right? Okay, all, all right. right. It's a private, non-profit museum, and it's funded neither by the federal government or the state. The only thing we get from the state is to tie up to this state pier, but we provide the security for the whole place. So mm -hmm. We're really paying for that in one way. Yeah. Size-wise, she's a little less than half a football field in length, the original ship and this one. Um, if you measured from the boomkin, which is this here, if you took a tape measure and ran it from the boomkin to the bowsprit in the front, that's 136 feet. If you measured from the beak's head to the stern, the overall length is 106 feet. And if you measured the deck length, it would be from here to here, that's 90 feet. So all the pilgrims lived in the area that runs from here to here. All their supplies are down below, and that's 90 feet by 25 feet wide, or 25 feet in the middle. It goes like this, of course. It hmm. has six sails, one, two, three, four, five, and the little mizzen sail in the stern, which is triangular shape. And of course, they never look like that. They always more or less look like that. <laughs> this is just so you can see the whole right. view of it. We actually brought it to dry dock to have a new rudder put on, and now we found out that a whole bunch of planking all the way up to here needs to be replaced. We've got a bunch of stuff all underwater. Mm -hmm. yep. 
So pictures of her on the sale, Boston Harbor sale in 2001. We just furl sale and the tug's taking us in at night. Uh, another sale in 95, I believe that was in 95, um, out to Provincetown. And some guys furling some sail up there. And this is part of the crew that took it to Miami, Florida. It went to Florida in 1957 after it came here. Sailed to New York where they had a ticket tape parade for the crew. And it sailed on down to Miami, Florida and back again. Hmm. Just for some publicity. Then out here, hopefully we have some things that you might be interested in. I know we're getting close to closing time, so they might be taking some away. But they haven't taken it all away. This is how she's rated. This container is called a TUN, T-U-N. Mayflower was built to carry 181 of those in volume. They can, it's 265 gallons. They can weigh up to 2,300 pounds apiece. And Mayflower 2 and the original Mayflower can carry 180 of those. Do they have salted meat in them? They could be. Yeah. yeah. Depends on what they carry. Her, Mayflower's primary job was lumber and wine. Okay. So, but for, for this trip, they carried everything. I mean, this was an investment, this 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 colony in a way. I mean, there's well, the, the there's a lot of isn't. talk about it, you know. Right. The ship it's, isn't, but the merchant adventurers have paid for this whole journey. Right. They paid for everything. They've hired the pilgrims, as we call them, or the colonists. Um, they've hired the ship and Master Jones with his crew to bring them here. Uh, the speedwell was a bonus that didn't work out, but they get the people from that. So uh, they're yeah, looking for a rate of return of what they're doing. Yeah. Hundred two workers. <laughs> They'll be sending back fish, salt fish, excess amount of crops, lumber, herbal medicines, anything they can get to send back as a profit. Fur turns out to be a bonus. Make a lot of money from fur. Okay. Some samples of the food there. There's ship's biscuit which is the bread that they would have with them. It's a very hard tack biscuit. We call it hard tack in the Civil War. They called it ship's biscuit. There'd be um, uh, oats, peas, rice, uh, currants, prunes, beans. All that stuff would be on board, plus salt pork, salt beef, and salt fish. Uh, the meals consisted of a peas pottage usually with some salt pork or salt beef or some fish cut in, depending on the day you were having it, that kind of thing. All the food is provided by the investors. Uh, the hot food, definitely for the crew. How much hot food the passengers got, we're not sure of. Hmm. It's law that Master Jones feed his sailors one hot meal a day if the weather permits. And beer is their primary beverage. They drink ten times the alcohol that we do today, and they eat ten times the salt level that we do today. So there's 10,000 gallons of beer on board Mayflower, and it's supposed to be divided amongst the uh, sailors get more because they need more. They're working. Right, they're working. Right. Everybody else is out there just for the ride, I right. guess. Yeah. The armor would be on board because the investors would probably pay for that. You as a common, ordinary man might not have a set of armor like that. Uh, a breastplate and a metal helmet, that would probably be provided by the... Uh, it's on your bill, but it's provided by the investors. Everything is on your bill because it's all payback time. Right, so when you get here, you're going to start have, working, you're going to pay back. Whatever you yeah. bring is yours, mm -hmm. but whatever the investors supply, you're going to be charged. Mm. So this is Travis board for keeping track of the orders that get shouted down to the helmsman. The ship is sailed uh, by a man on a deck up above who shouts orders down to two helmsmen below who move a lever to steer the ship. And if I shouted down to them hard to a westerly course, they'd put a peg in the first hole and I might shout down at the same time that we're traveling at three miles. Well, let's say four miles an hour. Let's be good about it. And this happens throughout a four-hour watch. Each one of these holes represents one hour of a four-hour watch. So at the end of four hours, let's say we travel west for four hours, then we'd have eight pegs along this hole eight pegs in here and eight pegs alternating here for each half hour. This is how they would keep it. That's how they how keep track of it. The direction at, and how long they at travel. At the end of speed. four hours a navigator comes down, writes all this down on a slate, clears the board, goes up into his little cabin where they do the math work and figure out whether they're lost or not. I see. Tra uh, cross staff for sighting on the sun and stars is basically used. You put it up to this eye like this. You move this back and forth until you get the sun up here and the horizon here. Then you take a measurement and get your latitude. Mm -hmm. So they can find their north and south position or their latitude. 